set in the 24th century, when Earth is part of a united federation of planets, its narrative is centered on the eponymous space station Deep Space Nine, located adjacent to a wormhole connecting Federation territory to the Gamma Quadrant on the far side of the Milky Way galaxy. The station is commanded by Captain Benjamin Sisko, a distinguished Starfleet officer. The space station was constructed by Bajoran slave labor overseen by the Cardassians in orbit during their occupation of the planet. Under the Federation administration following the Cardassian withdrawal, the station was relocated into the Denorio's belt. There, Deep Space Nine became a vital commercial port and defensive outpost due to its location near the mouth of the wormhole. It later became a key strategic location during the Dominion War for both the Dominion and the Federation Alliance. Most of the raw materials used to build the station were found in the Bajoran system, but some had to be mined from an asteroid closer to Cardassia Prime. Cardassian-run facilities were used to construct the hull plating, power transfer conduits, and parts of the fusion generator. Construction started with the Midcore, here the Cardassians established a temporary command center, along with basic habitable spaces for the workforce. Next came the Lower Core, where more permanent residences and work areas were set up and preparations began for installing the fusion reactors. The Upper Core came third, and the temporary command center relocated here once its systems were operational. The main generator shell housed the reactors and the radiator cone was designed primarily for emergency plasma venting but was also used for routine energy regulation. However, excess energy was retained and reintroduced to the system at a later time. The core involved building and activating the fusion generator. Ever mindful of attacks from the resistance, the Cardassians also installed reactive shield armor and shield emitters at this point. When the fusion generator was functional, work began on the promonade, and the command center made its final move to the ops module. Last of all, turbolift interlinks were connected and atmospheric integrity was established throughout the core. The inner ring, known as the habitat ring, was built next along with the crossover bridges that connected it to the central core. The weapons sails were manufactured as separate modules in nearby orbit and connected to the habitat ring as they became available. On the operations, the module was the ops, communication array, and the deflector assembly with the shield generators and emitters located in between ops and the promonade. The bridges were then built out to their fullest extent and the docking pylons took shape around them. The pylons were completed by the installation of ore processing equipment, leaving only the construction of the outer ring, known as the docking ring, before the station was fully formed. For this size comparison, let's start with the USS Defiant which is around 171 meters or 561 feet in length. Measuring 1452 meters across and 969 meters tall, Deep Space Nine was one of the largest civilian inhabited space stations known to the Federation in the late 24th century. It comprised 98 levels divided into 19 sections linked by access conduits made of 2 meter thick duranium a substance impenetrable to most known scanning techniques. Visually, the station bore very little resemblance to the average Federation starbase, which was hardly surprising, given that it was built by the Cardassians as a base for refining iridium ore. As for the massive space dock, it measured at a height of around 10,700 meters or 6.6 .6 miles with a diameter of 8,781 meters or 5.4 miles. The space station has a total mass of around 71 million metric tons and can accommodate about 85,000 officers and Starfleet personnel and about 120,000 to 240,000 civilians. On the docking ring is the secondary docking port and the RCS thrusters. Unlike a starship, Deep Space Nine had no need for impulse or warp engines. Instead, 
it relied on 54 lower power thrusters to maintain and adjust its position in space. More than 20 ships could be moored at the station at any one time, thanks to 12 ports distributed around the docking ring, another 6 ports at the tips of the docking pylons, and 6 landing pads set into the habitat ring. At the top and bottom of the docking pylon were the pylon docking port, airlock assembly, and control gondola. The docking pylon sweeping modules contained the large or processing facilities, and also permitted the docking of large starships at the station. The first support craft to be assigned to Deep Space Nine were runabouts, mainly used for exploratory missions, but the Dominion threat later called for the assignment of the USS Defiant to defend the station. The runabouts were a type of ship that was ideal as a support craft because of its exploratory missions. The ship was a warp capable Federation starship and was the primary method of transport and defense support for the Gamma Quadrant, and typically carried more cargo than shuttles. It measured at 23 meters or 75 feet in length, 14 meters or 46 feet wide, can accommodate about two-person flight crew and can carry two other crew with a maximum speed of warp 5. The original station defense was three weapon sails, each projecting about and below the habitat ring. On the habitat ring was the weapon sail with the rotary phaser cannon and phaser emitters. In addition, there were six landing pads in the habitat ring, which often carried diplomats and dignitaries directly to their quarters without encountering any cargo traffic. Under Starfleet supervision, Deep Space Nine was transformed into a battle station with several retractable torpedo launchers and phaser emitters. The operations center, usually known as OPS, was Deep Space Nine's equivalent of a Starship Command Bridge. It was where senior officers monitored and assessed threats to the station from outside, while also giving orders relating to life on the inside. It was a traffic control base overseeing the docking and departure of ships, as well as passage through the wormhole a tactical control room, a conference space, a communication station, and even one of several transporter rooms. Located at the top of the station core, on level 1, Ops centered on a large command table and was overlooked by an elliptical viewscreen. On the opposite side of the room from the screen, double doors led to a private office for the exclusive use of the station commander. Possibly the single most important workstation was the engineering console, which allowed for oversight of all critical systems, including power generation, life support, weapons, and the nearby transporter. A more hands-on approach to all these systems could be taken in the pit area directly below the view screen, giving direct access to the computer core, which extended to level two. In this respect, Ops was not only the station's bridge, but also its main engineering deck. The station commander of Deep Space Nine had a private office adjoining Ops. Designed to look down on the operations center from a position of superiority, Deep Space Nine's command office was once the sanctuary of the station's Cardassian prefect. With a curved rear wall following the shape of the upper core bulkhead, Cisco's office looked out across the station asterisk to space through a dramatic eye-shaped window. A large desk in front of the window dominated the room facing the ornate doors that led directly to Ops, while two less conspicuous side doors circumvented the control center altogether. A small sit-down meeting area was arranged on the right of the room, from the visitor's perspective. Away from the operations table and engineering areas, the key workstations in Ops were the science station, for the analysis of sensor readings from inside and outside the station, as well as archived data retrieval strategic operations, a variety of monitoring and diagnostic posts that could be repurposed as required. Two turbo lifts, one on either side of the room completed the layout, providing rapid access to all areas of the station and the three transporter pads for beaming personnel directly to ops. The promenade was at the heart of commercial and social life in Deep Space Nine. 
Located below Ops, the thoroughfare formed a circle around the upper core and was lined with shops, eateries, and station facilities such as the security office and the infirmary. A mezzanine level looked down on the bustling scene and out through large circular windows to the wormhole. Sleeping in this area was also prohibited, as was trading without a license. The promenade was also home to the station's temple, and during religious festival celebrations would extend beyond its doors. The biggest and most notorious bar on the promenade attracted everyone from smugglers to Starfleet officers and operated on just the right side of the law. Quark's Bar, Grill, Gaming House, and Hollow Sweet Arcade was the largest establishment on Deep Space Nine, spanning both main levels of the promenade and extending up to a third level just for Hollow Suites. The main level was home to the bar and a casino area, a dartboard at the request of Chief O'Brien, and the Debo table. Spiral stairs rose to the upper levels, with seating available on all three. Table and bar service was often provided by Cork himself, who prided himself on knowing his customers' needs and monetizing them. This included selling goods and services beyond the usual remit of a barkeeper, and so Cork's was known as a one-stop shop for obtaining the unobtainable. To compete with the nearby Repamat, Cork kept a wide range of real beverages in a secure storeroom. However, most meals were replicated from a station behind the bar. Turbo lifts were located on both sides of Cork's bar, and the main entrance faced out toward the station's infirmary. Smaller tables on the upper levels provided a view of the main floor. This made them ideal for private business deals as well as more romantic occasions. The centerpiece of the bar was an illuminated three story mural, and behind it was the doorway to the hollow suites. At the center of the bar was a large tango table to attract talented card players as well as spectators. As a briefing space, a function lounge, and a diplomatic meeting area, the wardroom played a pivotal role on the station, right up until the end of the Dominion War. Deep Space Nine's wardroom was located on level 13 in the station's central core. The long, multipurpose space was most often used as a briefing room for senior staff but it could also be a venue for diplomatic events and social functions. A long illuminated table in the wardroom could easily seat 14 people and has a display screen at the end of the room. In the background were the large windows along one side of the room added to the grandeur of the space when it was dressed for ceremonies and receptions. Everyone from the station commander to the itinerant courier had a home in Deep Space Nine's habitat ring though duty often kept them away from these personalized private spaces. Everybody who stayed on Deep Space Nine was assigned a private living quarters in the Habitat Ring. Most of the workforce on the station was mostly kept in pens, away from the Habitat Ring. In the station Starfleet era, most of the senior staff lived in the larger quarters while the smaller rooms were based for the civilians. Both kinds of accommodation followed a standard layout with an open living area leading off to one or more bedroom suites. Food replicators were located in the main living area, which usually had at least one large, circular window. A portable workstation meant that offices could work whenever they chose while large porthole windows offer views out into deep space. The choice of furnishings was entirely down to the individual. The environmental controls in each set of quarters could also be set according to the needs of the resident. For example, the chief of security had no quarter to call his own, and when he finally requested a room for himself, he furnished it like no other on the station. The station's original surgery was built with Cardassians in mind, but under Dr. Julian, it became a lifesaver for diverse species from all across the galaxy. The freestanding biobed could be removed or replaced for examining non-humanoids. This sensor cluster also generated a low-level antibacterial force field. The freestanding biobed could be removed or replaced from examining non-humanoids. The infirmary stocked a wide variety of medicinal products that could not be easily replicated. The doctor conducted most of their research at this workstation and the infirmary welcome desk was also a fully equipped medical workstation 
with access to a vast array of scientific data and analytical power drawn from the main computer core. The facility was located on the promenade, directly opposite a turbo lift, and the main entrance to Quark's bar. Like the rest of the station, it followed a Cardassian design, meaning that it bore little resemblance to a Federation starship sickbay. The Defiant is a prototype warship stationed at Deep Space Nine that was in part designed by Commander Benjamin Sisko himself. Starfleet's first warship, the USS Defiant, was created as the first line of defense against the enemy ships of the Borg and the Dominion. The USS Defiant was the prototype vessel for Starfleet's Defiant-class starships. Compact, efficient, and incorporating the latest in weapons and defensive technology, it was Starfleet's first true warship. Like all battleships, it had very few comforts and no provision for families, nor was it furnished for diplomatic missions. It was, as its designers intended, a heavily armored, stripped-down vessel created as the first strike vehicle for deployment in war. It still remains one of the most unique and important starship designs in Federation history and abandons many of Federation design philosophy because it was designed to be specifically as a battleship. The USS Defiant was considerably smaller than most Federation starships. It had a normal operational crew of 40 people but could accommodate up to 192 during an emergency. Work on the Defiant project began in 2366 after Starfleet was alerted to the threat of a Borg invasion. As befitted its role, the USS Defiant was considerably smaller than most Federation starships. It measured 171 meters long. 134 meters in width, and 30 meters in height. It had a normal operational crew of 40 people but could accommodate up to 192 in emergencies. In addition, the USS Defiant has a maximum warp speed of 9.982. Work on the Defiant project began in 2366 after Starfleet was alerted to the threat of a Borg invasion. Deep Space Nine began life as a Cardassian ore processing plant, but under joint Bajorian and Federation control, it became the key strategic outpost at the mouth of a stable wormhole. The overall design and architecture of Deep Space Nine were rather unique due to the influence of the Cardassians' design philosophies and many of the sections, living quarters, and operation centers don't resemble many of Starfleet traditional design language. Unfortunately, a detailed deck-to-deck -deck comparison or schematic couldn't be found during my research, so much of the layout and location of each section were rather basic. In addition, many of the restrooms or heads were omitted and weren't really mentioned on the schematic or cross-section drawing. In contrast, with the other series, Deep Space Nine took place on a space station instead of a starship. It also depended on continuing story arcs, many recurring characters, and darker themes. Not only was the general premise of Deep Space Nine so different from what had come before, but so too was its cast of characters. So what are your thoughts on Deep Space Nine? Let me know in the comments section below, and thanks for watching.